Good morning. Fantastic. My name's David Wise. I'm the other pastor of the uh, the church here, in addition to to Warren. Um, I've been when I've been here on Sundays. I'm not here a huge number of times, but when I'm here, we've been looking at one Peter, and uh, we're going to finish one Peter today. We're going to look at the last part of the last chapter. So, a final reminder that uh, Peter wrote this letter to churches in. Uh, the area that we now call Turkey, to encourage them to stand firm. They were having a tough time. Life was difficult for them as Christians. Uh, They could find themselves in all sorts of trouble. It wasn't illegal to be a Christian, but they could find themselves in difficulty in court and so on if they were Christians. And he was writing to them to encourage them to stand firm under faith. Who was here last week? Sure, there were more than about 15 of us here last week, from what I remember. Anyway, so um, what were the key things? <clears throat> this passage we're looking at now builds directly on what we looked at last week. So, can you cast your mind back a whole seven days? What were the key things we learned last week? Don't all have to. I should explain, by the way, if, you, if you're in my um, one of my teachings for the first time, I, I have this habit of asking questions and wandering around with the microphone and listening to the answers. So I'm going to do that quite a lot this morning. So this is the first of those. So last week I did see a hand. It's part of my comment that the first person to put their hand up is always at the back. I've, I've noticed this. I hope your hand went up and you weren't just, just having a scratch. Um, I remember two things. I don't know if you call them pertinent, but you had us all making the noise of sheep because it was talking about we are sheep and seeing the leaders um, as the shepherds um, and Jesus as the chief shepherd. But also, I think the thing that I remember most is that he talked about humility and that apparently was very countercultural in the time. Can you remember what humility meant? No. (laughs) Thank you for that contribution. Yeah, we, uh, you, those who were here last week had a lot of practice making barring noises. You did actually quite well at that eventually. Anything else from last week? That was a pretty good summary. Um, well done. But some other things as well. Remember we talked... At, ah, yeah, yeah. I think we looked at the qualities of a good shepherd. I think so. We did look at the causes of a good shepherd. And one of those things we talked about, <clears throat> not just leaders, but in, in our lives as Christians, it's not what we say that really matters. It's what we do. That we lead people, leaders, good leaders, lead people by example. Good parents lead their children by example, not by telling them what to do, but by, by doing it. And, and as Christians... In society, in our families, wherever we are, we we communicate the good news. We communicate the reality about God by what we do, about how we live our lives, rather than simply what we say. So we explored that last week as well. Okay, so we're starting today, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. And you'll be pleased to know that I won't be asking you to make roaring noises today to be like lions. So I just thought I'd just reassure you as we come in to read this next uh, piece, which begins like this. Stay alert. Watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your Christian brothers and sisters all over the world are going through the same kind of suffering you are. Now we need to remind ourselves that as Christians we do have a real enemy. We have an enemy, a real enemy. The devil, Satan, whatever phrase that you want to use. And it's been part of Satan's strategy throughout history to convince people that he's not real, he's not a threat. I mean, the great caricature of, of this funny creature with a pointed stick and a pointed tail that, that you know, is, is, a, is a laughing stock 
is a great strategy for people not taking him seriously. I actually would think that that's almost a demonic strategy, getting himself looked at as a laughingstock. He's serious, a serious enemy. And this image of a, of a lion would have had huge impact. As, as people sat in church on the first time they heard this letter written to them, and that image was there, what would have come up in their mind is what they had seen in the amphitheater. It was um, a standard part of, of sport that uh, people, slaves, convicts, would fight, in inverted commas, in the arena against hungry lions. Uh, the lions always won, by the way. And they would have seen people being ripped apart and eaten by lions. Hence this phrase here, looking for someone to devour. There would have been a shudder down the spines of everyone in the congregation as they heard that image. But their response, as our response, is not to be a response of fear. Satan is a real enemy. Satan is a powerful enemy. But, but, our response is not to be one of fear. Our response is to be, as Peter puts it here, to stay alert, to watch out. 1 Peter 1 verse 13 says this, Think clearly, exercise self-control, look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So just before we we go into that. Let me read one other verse, actually. Chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Before we look a bit more at, at Satan and something of his, his strategy, um, what does it mean in practice to, to stay alert, to watch out for Satan? Not back in Peter's day, but here in 2019... In West London, we don't have many lions actually around in West London, wandering around the streets. Some of you come from countries where, you know, lions do wander around and do occasionally eat people. But I don't think it happens in West London very often. What is, so what does it mean for us to be in this context of Satan prowling around a roaring lion? What does it mean for us to stay alert, to watch out. What is God asking us to do? I, I heard the voice. I didn't see where it... Ah, okay. Yeah, God is telling us to stay firm in prayers. Mm -hmm. To pray. Yeah, absolutely. To always make sure that our lives line up with his word. Yes, our, our lives need to be in order because if we're out of order, we're more vulnerable to Satan. I'm going to come around to you, but I'm going to talk to this lady on the way. Wise choice. Um, to I should explain this lady's my wife, so I've got to be really well behaved here. <laughs> to um, watch out for the things that might take us away and devour our time and our space away from God. Very good. I'm not just saying it's very good because she's my wife. I'm just saying it's very good because it was. So there we go. Excuse me. To control our thinking and not be led by feelings, because feelings can run out of control. But, you know, if we're of the mind of God, then we can control our thinking. Very good. I'm going to come back to that thing on feelings in a minute. I've got some things to say around that. Anything else? Oh. Um, I think to be aware of thoughts that come from the devil rather than from God, and to, to stop them in the tracks and just say, that is, that is sin talking in my head, I'm not going to listen to that. Very good, very good. 
Yeah, so we need to um, be able to recognize um, Satan. You know, he doesn't come like with pokey ears and a stick. Um, so, you know, his ways are just to, like with Adam and Eve, he's just to question what God said. So we need to know what God says on sort of given situations. I mean, the Bible doesn't say, oh, look up this, how to do that. You know, we need to know God and know his ways. So when Satan tempts us and tries to lead us astray, that we can discern that that's not God's way or that's not what we should be doing or thinking or whatever. Right, thank you. I think um, to be very alert, uh, because um, as he described the devil as a, like the lion is quite quick, if you are not alert, not very watchful, when the devil hits, it's very difficult because you can't run away from the lion when the lion is on you. So that's just it. Right, thank you very much. Uh, one more, last one. Just to go further with that, when you're sitting at the office at the beginning of the day, you shouldn't be surprised when something unexpected comes. So this is about staying alert, keeping watchful. Thank you. Several of those things that you've said, we're going to pick up a little bit later in the, uh, uh, in the passage as well. You know, the devil is not stupid. The, the devil is not, he's not stupid. He's, he's smart. You only got to think about that in the way that he encountered Jesus in the temptations. Uh, he took scripture, he twisted its application, but Jesus was alert. He was listening to God and he could spot that. He can be, Satan can be quite deceptive. Here's an example 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 14 and 15. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. It's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So we need to be on our guard. We need to be watching. We need to be alert. But also we need to remember that Satan is already a defeated foe. He was defeated by Jesus' resurrection. That broke his power. He thought he had defeated God. <laughs> mm -hmm. In his resurrection, Jesus took the keys, the power from Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. He's a real foe. But he's a defeated foe. He wanders around like a prowling lion. But his defeat means that there is a real sense, if you extend the metaphor a bit here, that he's on a leash. He can't do exactly what he pleases because his power has been broken. Because God is in control. Jesus is Lord of all. It is God, our Heavenly Father, that's running the universe sustaining it by his mighty word of power. And Satan's destiny, his end, his fixed already. It's interesting here that we're not asked to fight Satan. To be aware, to be alert, but we're not actually asked to fight him. What we're asked to do is to stand firm. Now, standing firm isn't a passive strategy. Standing firm is not the same as sitting in an armchair with a cup of tea or whatever it is your afternoon drink might be. Standing firm is an active strategy. In fact, standing firm in some ways is a bit aggressive. Because you're saying, this is ground on which I'm standing. And I am not moving. Because this is my ground. I'm standing on the rock. This ground is my ground. 
this is where I stand. So there's almost an aggression in standing firm. And that's what we are asked to do, to stand firm. I, I want to read three brief passages from the New Testament. And then I want you to think about, well, I want you to be thinking about yourselves as I read this passage. And again, thinking about the fact that it's now 2019, we live in West London. I want you to think, what does this mean in practice for me as I live my life? Or people around me live their lives? What, is, what, is this, what does this look like? How does this apply right now? Is that okay? Is that okay? Good. Just checking. I'm gonna, you're right, I'm going to do it anyway. Ephesians 6 and verse 13. You don't need to turn to these. If you want to, you can. Um, they're just uh, verses or pairs of verses that I'm going to read. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Stand your ground. Let me read from James. James chapter 4 and verse 7. Humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Can we just say that together? Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And finally, before we come to answering the question I asked you just now, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. There's that phrase again. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. God is faithful. He will enable you to stand. Yeah. I think that's worth an amen. Okay, so what does it look like in practice for us? You know, this week, think about the things you might be, might be doing in the office, at home, at work, uh, wherever you might be. What? Well, what is this, this standing firm against Satan? What does it look like for you? Mm. I can see lots of thinking going on. So always someone at the back that puts their hand up first. I've, you know, it's good exercise for me, so that's uh, that's fine. Um, in in this day and age, it means um, things will happen. Yes, God hasn't promised us a rosy uh, pathways, but things will happen, be it at work or at home or wherever we are, that will bring about conflicts of interest between what the world is saying and what God is saying. Mm -hmm. And it's a way of actually saying, the world might be going right, but if God says, this is, you have to go left, I have to make sure that's the way I'm going, despite the resistance, that God will walk me down that path. So it, it, may, it may be your boss at work. It may, it may be, um, I, I don't mean personally, I don't know your boss, so if they're watching this video, it isn't about them personally, but it might be your boss at work. It, it, it might be a fellow uh, employee. It, 
It might be a friend, someone in your family, that says to you, why, why don't you do this rather than that? And you know that this is actually not God's way. And so that standing firm is about keeping your feet, standing on God and saying, no, this is where I stand. So that, thank you, that's excellent. What else? Am I putting God's word in practice mm -hmm. and not to be afraid when accusations or challenges come my way and not, you know, God is greater than Satan. So, you know, he gives us the victory, mm -hmm. not Satan. So when people come against us with stuff that is false, we stand firm on God's word. This is God's word. This is where we stand. Excellent. I saw someone else's hand, but I can't. Ah, okay. It can be about your boss at work. There's disagreements because sometimes your boss may not be a Christian. So boss may say, well, we are all children of God. But I will not respond to that because it's not the time or the place to have that kind of theological discussion. We'll get there eventually. <laughs> She's on the way, but it's an ongoing discussion. But I will not concur with things that are not true. I'll just be quiet. She's intelligent. She knows. Great. Thank you. Perhaps it could be when we have to make decisions and uh, we might look at a situation that seems easy. We might be tempted to take an easy option, which we know is not what God wants us to do, but it seems the easy option. It seems a quick option. And so sometimes it can be tempting to go against what we believe and do what we think is the easy way out to, for a quick decision if we feel we're under pressure. Right. Um, a lot of the opposition I've had are from people who call themselves Christians, um, where they see I've been going through a lot of struggles and everything else throughout years, and they say to me things like, oh, you're in the wrong faith. Um, it's that religion that you're in and things like that. To, and I have to really like hold on to God and, and ask him what is going on. Is, but he says to me, you know, Jesus said that, he, you know, he came to give us peace. We're not going to always have a rosy time. It's gonna, we're going to go through trials and tribulations, but we're to endure. Thank you very much. Okay, so these three, uh, four, and then I'll call it a day. Um, a, show, a soldier um, doesn't become uh, fearsome and ready uh, in a day. It takes a period of time of developing and uh, learning and training and for us as children of God it takes time for us to develop ourselves and how do we develop ourselves is by immersing ourselves in God's word um, to get us to this stage and to the point whereby we are able to um, withstand whatever that comes. We, we can't stand on God's word if we never read it that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> So we need to be people that are reading it or listening to it or whatever it is, but taking it in so it becomes a part of us so we can stand on it. Thank you. Um, I guess it's remembering who we are. We sang earlier on today, I know who I am. And it's very easy, I would suggest, to sing that here when you've got the music and supported with everyone else. But when during the week you're on your own, you can feel very vulnerable and standing firm is difficult. And then that's when I think we need to remember who we are. Very good, thank you. Sometimes we forget that we're not on our own in the workplace. We may, we may feel completely isolated and think it's just us against our work colleagues and the situation we're in. And then it takes a friend or a Sunday morning to remind you that actually Jesus is standing right beside you and whatever is happening to you is happening to him and perhaps maybe you get to see the situation in a different way in that you'll see that how you're being treated is how Jesus is being treated in that situation and it will give you the viewpoint to change your space. And that's why we need to come to church, and that's why we need to be together. When, it's, when, in reality, when you're actually going through it, you just want to be on your own. Uh, not to let Satan get under your skin, not to let him to do things you're not supposed to do. And also not to let him arouse you so much that you lose your temper and shut other people and not be lonely. 
Great, thank you very much. So what I want you to take from all of that is actually that, that what we're talking about here is not an exceptional circumstance. That, you know, once in a blue moon, you need to stand your ground. Or, you know, once in a blue moon, I'm not quite sure what a blue moon is, but you get the image. Well, one, once in a blue moon, you, you, you have to, um, you know, stand up for what is right. You have to, you know, stand for the truth. This is a part of your daily life, your everyday experience. All the time, all the time, Satan and those that follow his ways are wanting you to deviate from what God is calling you to do. All the time. And all the time, our response is we're being alert, we're being aware of what's going on, and we're standing firm. And as our sister said earlier on, this isn't about how we feel. As you've heard me say many times, feelings are a great guide to how we feel. They're not a guide to God's truth. They're not a guide to the reality of the universe. They're a great guide to how we feel. Nothing wrong with feelings. Nothing wrong with allowing ourselves to feel. But we need to be aware that they are not a great guide as to what is true. And as someone else said just now, I've got a note here, just remembering also that we're not alone in this. You know, we, we tend, particularly us um, Western European educated people, we, we, we read something like this and, you know, stand your ground. So in our image, in our minds, I would suggest, we see the solitary soldier standing their ground. That's the image that comes to our mind as, as Western Europeans. Let me tell you, most of the people in the rest of the world, when they hear that image, that's not what in their mind at all. Because you don't do it on your own. What, what, what a daft thing to do. You're standing in a group of people, standing your ground. Some of you are laughing. You, you absolutely get that straight away. That's what's in your mind. You, you're standing with a group of people. And that is the biblical reality. Us Western European educated individualistic thinking people, actually our minds are not in line with what Scripture says. Sorry to disappoint you. I know people like to think, sorry, I'm going off down a slight cul-de-sac here. I know people like to think that, you know, the Western uh, educational system is superior and all of that sort of stuff. Well, this is one particular way when it is completely off kilter. You know, we're coming out of the stuff from the Enlightenment and all of that. This individualistic thinking is not what the Bible says. It's just not there. Almost every you in the Bible is plural. So when you are standing your ground, it's not... Can I just borrow you a moment? Thank you, as you're just sitting in the front row. So this is not the image, you standing your ground. Can I borrow the rest, three rows here? Can you just come and stand out the front here just for a moment? Just I ask you to do anything but stand, okay? So there's no trick in this. I just want you to come and stand here. Uh, come along, uh, come, come along. Uh, come along as well, it's all right. I know you're, I know you're sort of... Visiting, I've not seen you before, you might have been here many a time. So this is what standing looks like, people. Okay, this is what standing the ground looks like. It's not about you on your own at work. I mean, you might be on your own in that moment, but actually this is who you are. This is who you're a part of. The people of God all the time with your brothers and sisters. So when you're standing your ground, this is what it looks like. Even if you're in your office on your own with your computer and there's no one else there, this is what standing your ground looks like with other people like this. This is normal Christian life. Thank you. So Give them a round of applause. They've done wonderfully. You know, Satan wants to convince you that you're on your own. That actually there's no one else that knows what's going on. There's no one else who's experiencing what you're experiencing. Complete and total hogwash. Demonic lies. We're always part of God's family. Verse 10. In his kindness... God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered for a little while, he will restore, 
support and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. All power to him forever. Amen. Amen. One, wrote, one person I read this week writing on this said this. A guy called Clowney said, Grace that can meet every need and prevail in every situation. That's what an offer for us. Grace that will meet every need and prevail in every situation. Isn't that great? Another person, Job's, wrote this. This is interesting. What we believe about our future shapes how we live today. What we believe about our future shapes how we live today. Today, if we believe that God is going to restore, support, and strengthen us, placing us on a firm foundation, even when it's tough in the short term, your eyes on that future. This is something which is passing. It's the point that Peter is making there. And firm foundation... Uh, you all know that the, uh, the parable Jesus told about the two men. I mean, we do it, you, if you were in Sunday school, you used to do it in Sunday school, didn't you? The, the two men that built their houses, one of them built upon the rock and the other one built on the sand and the rain came down and the floods came up. Oh, I'm sort of nearly going into a Sunday school song then. The rains came down, the floods came up and the person that built their house on the sand, it all fell down. But the one that built it on the rock, it still, it, you, you get the image. So this is about here, that we are built on a firm foundation. This is my last but one question this morning. What does it actually mean? And we all sing that, well, some of us sort of sing that song, the floods came down, the blah, blah, blah. What does it actually mean for our lives to be built on a firm foundation? What is the foundation... And I, I don't want a, an easy answer like, well, it's God. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, it's God, I get that. And, and it's God's word. Yeah, yeah, I get it's God's word. But, but what does it actually mean to have our lives built on a firm foundation? So that when the storms come, and they will come, when the floods come, and they will come, when the heavy rain falls out of the heavens, and it will, you're still standing. Because the ground doesn't move. What is that foundation like for you? My last but one question. So uh, my last question is really easy. So uh, this is the last difficult one. Okay, so I'd say for me, it's about my relationship that I have with God, with Jesus, and just knowing who he is, that he is faithful. So no matter what I'm going through, he stays the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, forever. Um, and there is a, a certainty and a surety in that that actually can override what you feel at the time because that's the truth of the matter, is he is the same and he is faithful. Great, thank you. This comes to my mind. Um, just uh, God keeps you no matter what you go through. If you stay close to him, he will stay close to you. Great, thank you. For me, it means all, all of the statement plus more that what's been deposited right from talking about Sunday school still is a foundation that is being built. So no matter what, now take, I'm going to take her youth as an example, where they go on earth, when they come across any storms of life, that foundation is there. And being the foundation that they stand on, that ground will not move, but things will work out for good because... The foundation is sturdy. Anything else? Standing firm in the word of God is today, if I'm called. Am I going to be firm? Have I stood firm? Leah Shaibu was captured. All the girls that were captured, she's the only one because of her faith. And she refused to denounce Jesus. She said she'd rather be killed. Up till now, she has not been 
released. Will I stand firm on my faith today if I'm in that kind of situation with God? Thank you. That's a reference to the schoolgirls who were uh, taken by Boko Harim in Nigeria, in case you didn't recognize the name. I've got to say, foundations are made up of quite a few elements, but one of the elements for me is this morning, we're a group of people worshipping together as people, standing firm, but it's part of that, that's part of my foundation that I'm here you know, on a regular basis sharing fellowship with you guys, and that's, that is a part of my foundation. Great, thank you. Okay, we come to the final few verses. Uh, verse 12. I've written and sent this short letter to you with the help of Silas, whom I commend to you as a faithful brother. My purpose in writing is to encourage you and assure you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Now, there's a motto for you when you're having a tough time. You might want to write it out on a big bit of paper, stick it on the mirror in your bathroom. What you are experiencing is truly a part of God's grace for you. Stand firm in this grace. Silas, by the way, was, um, we know more from the book of Acts, he probably was the person that wrote this letter for Peter. The way that letters were done in those days is that somebody dictated, somebody else wrote down. And also, the fact he's commended as a faithful brother, he probably was the postman. He probably took this letter from Peter around the churches and read it in each of the churches, because that was the practice in those days. I didn't have email, so it was, it was physically carried and then read in each context. Of course, there was only one copy, so it was taken around and, and read. That's how it, how it worked. So Silas was doing that. Final two verses. Your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings, and so does my son Mark. Greet each other with Christian love. Peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Babylon is a, is a code word here. Uh, Babylon's a city in the Old Testament where God's people were taken in exile. It was a powerful city, but a decadent city, a corrupt city. And it was the place of exile not of home. Do you remember that theme right back at the start of 1 Peter? Now, we are aliens. We are foreigners. We are just passing through this world. So here again is that same thing at the beginning and at the end. Here, Babylon actually stands for the city of Rome. Not just here. It's elsewhere in uh, the New Testament as well. It stands for Rome itself. There is this phrase here, which literally, the, the uh, New Living Translation, greet each other with Christian love, it literally says, and you'll see it down in the footnotes at the bottom, uh, the Greek literally says, greet each other with a kiss of peace. Now, among first century Jews, a greeting kiss was the common greeting, as it still is in, in much of the, of the Middle East. Um, I just wonder, this is a partly frivolous and partly serious question, and I'll come to the serious bit after we've done the frivolous bit. Um, what might this mean for us today in West London? Some people teach that you should take the Bible literally word for word. That what it says here is exactly what you should do, which means that this morning you should have all kissed each other. I'm sorry, so, you know, greet each other with a kiss. You were here this morning, you greeted each other. So, so what is it, what do you think this, in today's terms here, for us in West London, with the mix of people we have in this congregation here, what do you think this actually means for us today? So this is a slightly frivolous question, but there's a, a very serious point I want to make underneath this. Greeting each other. Which means what? How are you? How was your week? So speaking to each other verbally. So a verbal greeting. Okay. Let's see what else we've, we've got. I believe it's the culture of that time. And we, uh, as you rightly said, we are of the uh, diverse culture. And we need to do something that is acceptable to whoever we are 
greeting. Okay, I might pick that up in a moment. Just take a couple more, because I am being slightly facetious here. Be intimate with each other. Um, rather than kind of give the standard church answer when you're asked how you're doing, of, I'm fine, see you later. Actually take the time and be honest with each other and say what's really going on so that your person you're talking to has the opportunity, if they're prompted during the week, to pray for you. It, so it, okay, so it's about being open and vulnerable as well in that. I just see that other hand in, in the middle there. I'll come back over here in a minute. That'll be the last two. Excuse me. Well, for a start off, um, a kiss is a, it's a voluntary thing, so you both decided that. And I think in this context, it's recognising your unity, your oneness, your sameness in God. Okay, thank you. Make these the last two. Yes, it can mean giving someone a hug or a kiss, but it could also mean lifting people up in prayer, checking on them during the week, sending a text, WhatsApp, and uh, just encouraging them that you're praying for them. That's interesting equivalent to a kiss there, sending them a WhatsApp. I think that's an interesting uh, idea. I think praying for each other's needs is a way of, of helping each other, communicating with, with, you know, with God. Okay. So I, th I think... Uh, okay. <laughs> Just time. That's the most valuable thing to modern man is time. So if we give each other our time, that's intimate. Okay. So, all right, this very last one. I think it's like a kiss represents like love to me, maybe loving each other and being there for each other. So being, you know, bearing, bearing with one another and, yeah, caring, caring about your brothers and sisters. Okay, so this, this is about communicating care. It's about communicating an acceptance. It's about honoring and recognizing the other person. And I think we need to recognize that in a culture, a mixed culture that we have, a mixed multi-ethnicity here, this is about doing different things with different people. We had a guy that uh, used to come to the church. He, he has moved out of the area now. And back in those days, I'm going back quite a few years now, we, we used to have someone who used to welcome people, and their way of welcoming people was throwing their arms around them and hugging them. Now, this person came from a culture where actually um, that was absolutely anathema. When I went to visit them, talk about the church, they said, can you stop people hugging me? I hate it. It is disrespectful. They're coming into my space without invitation, and it is dishonoring to me. But, oh, that is really strong. I said, how do you, what's appropriate greeting for you? He said, um, it's an arm's length handshake. That honors me. I thought, okay. So I communicated to the person that was, when this person comes, arm length, no hugging arm's length handshake because it was about what honored him what showed that he was respected for who he is now for different people that's different things in different cultures in some cultures kissing when you meet is absolutely normal this is how people are are greeted in other cultures it's a hug in other cultures it's an arm length handshake it is about what is appropriate Hear the next bit, for the other person. It is always about honoring them. It's always about acknowledging them, respecting them, giving them time and all of that. But it is about what is helpful for the other person. Ah, how do we know that? Now, that is a really good question. So how do we know what works for other people? Well, what, how we know is that we actually can ask them. So I, I have the habit, for example, with, with people when I, who I don't know very well. Maybe they've talked to me for a while. Um, I mean, I might have a guess from, from their culture, but I, I, I won't hug anybody without actually asking them. You know, would, would, you, would you like, as, you know, as we finish the meeting, would you like a hug? Would, you know, and they can say yes, they can say no, they can offer their hand, they can say don't touch me. Because some people in some cultures 
actually touching them is offensive. Absolutely touching them at all is offensive. I interviewed someone this week for my, for my research uh, who's got a particular knowledge of a particular ethnic group. And they said, do you know, and I didn't know this, they said, if you touch that person in any way on their head, you are communicating massive disrespect to them. I thought, I had no idea that that was, that was the case. So it is about spending time. It is about asking. It is about finding out from people what works for different people, what's helpful to them, taking the time to do that. And if you're not sure, ask. You can say one thing very quickly. When it comes to me, I do not like people sticking their face right in front of me. A lot of people think because I can't see doing that. You don't need to do that. I'm a human being. And it really, really frustrates me when they do that. Thank you for sharing that, you see? <laughs> Okay, just to sum up from this morning, so uh, just that last phrase there, um, peace be with all of you who are in Christ. Whatever is going on, whatever opposition, whatever is happening to us, we can know God's peace all the time. And as you know, God's shalom peace is not an absence of difficulty. It's not an absence of conflict. It is about God's presence and being secure in him in the middle of all of that. Three things to take away this morning. Always remember that the devil was defeated by Jesus. Amen? Remember, we're not asked to fight him. We are asked simply to stand our ground and not on our own doing that. And finally, by God's grace, God will complete the work in us that his spirit began. Amen. God bless you, Marsha. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.